Dark Souls 3 is a better sequel than Dark Souls 2 in practically every aspect. It feels like a continuation of the events that proceed from Dark Souls 1, as opposed to feeling like a foreign world with yet another story to unravel. That's not to say that I think Dark Souls 2 is a bad game, but when you have to compare it to all the other games in the Souls series, I think 2 is by far the weakest contender of all four of those games. And by Souls games, I'm talking about Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3, which means I'm actually excluding Bloodborne. I'm not denying the existence of Bloodborne just because it doesn't have the word Souls in the title, but because I don't own a PS4, so I haven't had the chance to actually play Bloodborne yet. Because of that, you might find my judgment of 3 to be a little different in comparison to someone who has played Bloodborne. Oh, and uh, if you don't want bosses or the look of areas spoiled for you, just stop watching right here. My favorite thing about every game I've played in the Soul series is that they've always had these expansive worlds, and by extension, the bizarre lore that comes with them. In order of appearance, they start with Boletaria, to Lord Ron, then Drang Laic, and now Lothric. The reason that Lord Ron stands so high above all the others is because of how iconic, memorable, and intricate all of those areas were. I remember entering and Orlando for the first time, accidentally visiting the Painted World, suffering the frame rate of Blighttown, finding the Hidden Ash Lake, and getting stomped on by decrepit dragon asses in Lost Isolith. There are just so many memorable areas in the first game, whereas in Dark Souls 2, the only places I can really remember off the top of my head are, well, Hyde's Tower of Flame and Dragon Lake Castle. After I checked a wiki, I could remember places like Dragonary, Iron Keep, and the Shrine of Amana. But only the first two I mentioned really feel all that memorable. You didn't really get many wide shots of the landscape, and a majority of the worn out structures you explored weren't really all that impressive. And that's why I like Dark Souls 3 so much more than 2, because everything just feels so much more grandiose in comparison. The High Wall of Lothric, the very first zone you travel to, is best described as simply daunting. I wanted to climb up that massive bridge standing high above the horizon. And well, I was initially disappointed because I thought I was never going to get to do so, but by the end of the game, I was there, damn it, and it felt really good looking over the rest of Lothric from up high. But I have to say that my favorite area of this game, without a doubt, was Irithyll of the Boreal Valley, of which the initial reveal left me downright astonished. That crescent moon and aurora in the sky, that beautiful moonlit architecture, that slowly falling snow and those mountains in the distance, it was honestly perfect. I, I think this is my favorite looking area in the entire Soul series. These vast, sprawling land and cityscapes are what I truly love about these games. These gorgeously crafted environments that leave you in awe, as well as a yearning to explore every nook and cranny of them. Areas like the Smoldering Lake, the Catacombs of Carthus, and Farron Keep are very reminiscent, if not just downright throwbacks to the original areas of Dark Souls. I mean, jeez, you even return to Anor Londo during the final section of Irithyll. Areas this time around are just so much more memorable. Although, there is one thing about the overworld design that's not like Dark Souls 1, and that is that it's linear. One big old linear journey through Lothric, albeit not linear in the same sense that 2 or Demon Souls was, where you had multiple pathways to travel down. Lothric and the areas you traverse through are still technically interconnected, but not in the same way that they were in 1. If I were to give an analogy, think that if Lordran were to be considered a giant tree, Lothric is really just best described as a long road. You start at the top of a mountain, occasionally you veer off the beaten path to find a new path that will either just lead you in a circle or split off into a newer but shorter path altogether. And honestly, I don't mind that, because even though the journey through Lothric is just one long road trip, it feels like a very coherent road trip. Whenever you travel somewhere, you feel like the distance you covered getting to that place is actually tangible. If you get to a high enough spot, you can see where you started your journey, which feels like you're making actual progress and not like you're just wandering around aimlessly. Oh, and Firelink Shrine feels even more like the Nexus than it did in the first game. It's basically the Nexus 2.0. Its shape and general layout are very similar to the Nexus, and the five thrones basically represent the five Arcstones from Demon Souls. You acquire an interesting cast of characters, most of which are new faces or references to older characters, and of course, good old trusty Patches is always there to lend a hand, but I was legitimately surprised when I found Andre in the shrine for the first time. And I mean, come on guys, look at this level up waifu. Top fucking tier. Marry that firekeeper, fuck that black maiden, 
and kill that shitty ass Emerald Herald. Fuck you, you're a slut. God damn it, from. I know you are pandering hard to my feelings of nostalgia for these games. And the worst part is, I, I can't help but love it. Okay, so enough about world design. It's time to talk about some combat. The part of what I would consider to be the backbone of the Soul series. It's what I imagine a majority of people consider to be the most, if not the only important thing about the games. And after playing Demon's Souls, Dark Souls, and Dark Souls 2 for more than 100 hours each, I can honestly say that I really liked the combat in this game. It feels like a natural improvement in respect to all of the other Souls games. It's like, if you were to take all the precise attacks and weight of Dark Souls 1, and mix it with the smooth animations and movement of Dark Souls 2, you pretty much get what it feels like to play Dark Souls 3. Hell, even the hitboxes are better this time around, which makes it that much more enjoyable to play. The two most notable additions to the combat in Dark Souls 3 is the ability to charge heavy attacks, which I'm told was carried over from Bloodborne, and weapon arts. Now, weapon arts are completely new to Dark Souls, and I love them, because they make every single weapon in the game and their respective categories feel that much more unique. They essentially just add a third type of attack to every weapon in the game. For example, straight swords and katanas have a unique stance that adds a new set of attacks, axes and maces buff the player with extra damage or poise, daggers and small weapons have a secondary dodge skill which has more iframes, large weapons have a stomp that adds poise or damage, ranged weapons can shoot faster, or pierce multiple targets, and a bunch of other that I can't really name off the top of my head. Weapon arts just add so much more depth to the combat, and they're all honestly just really cool. Oh, and uh, another feature I was absolutely ecstatic to see returning from Demon's Souls was a mana bar. Or, well, it's called a focus bar, but it's basically just a mana bar. I'll probably never instinctually call it a focus bar. Regardless, with the return of mana, spells now run off a globalized resource, rather than just a set amount of casts per spell. Mana is also required for you to use weapon arts as well, although you can still use weapon arts without mana, just to less of an effect. Now, mana doesn't regenerate over time. You need Ashen Estus in order to refill it. In order to carry Ashen Estus, you need to cut into your supply of Normal Estus. On top of that, it still costs stamina to cast spells, and the amount of spells you can cast before needing to chug is determined on your attunement. Of course, there are rings and infusions that will suddenly regenerate mana for you, but overall, I much prefer using mana as a globalized resource for spells, as opposed to having a set amount of casts per spell. And now, PvP on the other hand, is a category that I both love and hate about every Souls game. It's something that I really want to enjoy, but usually end up not liking because, well, I'm honestly just not that very good at it. I almost feel like if I were to even utter the word balanced in this video in any context, someone in the comments section will just retort with something like blah 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 S-Talk, blah 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 Great Shield, blah blah Metallic Fruit, blah blah Sacred Flame, you get the point. So I'll simply just say that I enjoyed the PvP in Dark Souls 3 a lot more than in previous installments. And that's for a couple of reasons, the first of which is that I had a lot more PvP engagements at lower levels during the beginning of the game. The reason that PvP was more frequent at these lower levels is because the Red Eye Orb is back, and it's extremely easy to get your hands on it this time around. And while I did say that I wasn't very good at PvP in these games, I'm also not terrible either. I just say I'm okay at this point. I mean, by no means am I anywhere near as good as someone like Peeve Peeverson, Ouroboro, or any of the other dozen Dark Souls channels. But I do have three Souls games under my belt at this point, so I think I can safely say that I have some decent experience with these games, which gave me a bit of an edge over some of the newer players. But most importantly, the player cap was raised from 4 to 6 in Dark Souls 3. This means that you can get into fights that go up to 3 versus 3, and these fights are some of the most fun and hectic invasions I've ever taken part in. They were just an absolute blast to play. There's also a downside to having an increased player cap, and that is because very rarely do you end up in a fair fight during an invasion in Dark Souls 3. Almost every time I invaded someone at a lower level, it was just me versus four other guys. And those are odds that I just could not win against. And there are just so many other smaller features that I really loved about this game. Like, for example, I always thought that trying to play with your friends in previous Souls games was such a hassle, because you either just couldn't find each other's signs or you had to buy and use some convoluted in-game item in order to see each other. In Dark Souls 3, you can just set a matchmaking password and bam, no hassle, you can just see your friend's sign instantly. It's just so much more convenient and makes playing with your friends way easier and far less annoying. Oh, and thank Allah that soul memory is gone, because while there were benefits to that system, it made PvP into an absolute disaster to manage. 
In three, matchmaking runs off of your soul level and the reinforcement level of your most upgraded weapon. And because of that, matchmaking doesn't need to scale off your armor because you don't need to upgrade armor anymore. I, I love this because I can just wear whatever I want whenever I want. I can play fashion souls with any armor I find and never have to worry about upgrading it. Hell, every covenant feels like it has a viable purpose this time around. I mean, sure, the Blue Sentinels and the Dark Moon Blades are essentially the same thing, and the same thing goes for the Watchdogs of Farron and the Aldrich's Faithful, but every single one of them actually works as intended in this game. Oh, and lastly, I've always wanted some form of idle gestures in a Souls game, where maybe I could, like, lean against a wall or just sit down, and now I, I actually have that. There are just so many of these little tweaks, additions, and, and features I've been wanting for so long, and it's just so great to see them finally realized in a Souls game. So yeah, there are tons of things about this game that I really enjoyed, but that doesn't mean that it has absolutely no faults. Oh no, this game is definitely not perfect. I really like the combat in Dark Souls 3, but it doesn't really matter how good those combat mechanics are if the enemies you fight are practically just copy-pasted throughout the entire game. If there's one major gameplay element that Dark Souls 3 is lacking, it is in the enemy variety department. Practically every single enemy you fight in this game is some random variation of a tall, lanky hollow wearing some different assortment of armor and wielding some different type of weapon. Oh, and it's not just that. I feel like I was fighting these little thief faggots, like, for half of the game. I almost felt at times like there was at least one in every area. The Cathedral of the Deep has more walking corpses in it than Auschwitz did. You just fight so many goddamn hollows in this game. I think Farron Keep and the Catacombs of Karthus are the only places you don't actually fight any hollows. Dark Souls 3 is like the total opposite of Dark Souls 2. In 2, every area has a bunch of really cool and interesting enemies to fight, but an absolutely piss-easy and uninspiring boss. Dark Souls 3, on the other hand, has a bunch of really bland, copy pasta enemies placed all around each level, but at the end of which, has an extremely unique, memorable, and challenging boss fight. Well, they're all definitely unique. Okay, so here's the thing about bosses in Dark Souls 3. They're easy. They're slower, more telegraphed, and some are just not that fun to fight. The Ancient Wyvern, Yorm the Giant, and High Lord Wolnir are definitely cool fights, but require you to use an underwhelming gimmick in order to beat them. And the Deacons of the Deep? It, yeah, no, that's just lazy design. But a majority of the rest of the bosses in this game are actually really good. The problem is that they don't really start getting good until the later half of the game. Now to me personally, a boss battle doesn't entirely depend on how difficult it is. Sure, it's definitely the most important factor, but there's more to a boss fight than just how challenging it is. It's also about how menacing the boss looks, as well as how extravagant and over top their attacks and animations are. The environment and arena you fight them in also takes a big role as well, and the second most important aspect is without a doubt the music that accompanies the boss fight. If you combine all of those elements correctly, then you have what I would consider to be a fantastic boss battle. Don't get me wrong though, I still enjoyed fighting all the bosses in their early game my first time through, but Irithyll is definitely a turning point in this game in terms of overall boss challenge and quality. Pontiff Sullivan was the boss that changed my outlook on this game from, eh, this game's okay, to, wow, this game's pretty good. Practically every boss that you fight after Pontiff encompasses everything that I think makes boss fights great. They all look extremely intimidating, they have tons of ridiculous animations and attacks, you fight them in these iconic set pieces, they're all accompanied by a striking musical score, and most importantly, they are hard as hell to beat. In fact, I think Dark Souls 3 has got some of the most spectacular boss fights I've ever seen in a Souls game. And it's a shame, because while this game has some of the best bosses I think I've ever fought, there really aren't that many of them. Both that and the amount of areas that you visit in the game make it probably one of the shortest games in the Souls series. Dark Souls 2 may have had double the amount of bosses than this game did when you take the DLC into consideration, but only a handful of them, most of whom were DLC bosses, were even all that great. It's why I always stand by the statement, quality over quantity. At this point, I feel I may have exhausted my ability to rapidly inhale Miyazaki's Millimeter Peter. So I think it's time to talk more about some of the shitty things in Dark Souls 3. Okay, why the fuck are there so many goddamn bonfires in this game? Like, literally, sometimes I walk for maybe less than 30 seconds and I'll reach another one. 
They just I put mean, like a mandatory bonfire for every boss kill, but then they'll put like another bonfire like 20 steps away. When I was on my first playthrough, whenever I wished there was a bonfire somewhere nearby, it, it, it just wasn't there. But whenever I didn't need a new bonfire location, there is one within walking distance of the last one. The bonfire placement in this game is just all over the place and it's absolutely unneeded and fucking stupid at times. Oh, and also, I, I may think that this game has great feeling combat, but why the fuck is poise turned off? Why does it even show in the stats screen when it doesn't even matter how much poise you have if you just get staggered from one hit from any attack? I, I really hope that they add it back in either a DLC or, or say something along the lines of, R really? Oh, that's, that's, that's just great. Oh, and it's great that the red eye orb is back, but what about the blue eye orb? Why isn't that back? How the fuck are blues supposed to get summoned in the late game when everyone switches their covenant off of the way of the blue? And hey, every boss may be unique and interesting, but why the fuck aren't there any tails to cut off? Like, literally, I don't think a single boss has a removable tail. Like, a good chunk of the bosses that I fought in 1, and a few of the bosses in 2 had removable tails, but not in 3, and oh, oh, oh man, the day 1 launch for this game on PC was absolute garbage. Never in my entire life of playing video games has a game ever crashed as much as this piece of shit did. I think the most annoying part is whenever I tried to get a recording of it, my Ninshidia display drivers crashed, which in turn caused Shadowplay to crash, so I couldn't get any footage of it, and nor could I move past the fucking first bonfire of the game for almost over an hour! And you wanna know how I fixed it? I turned the lighting to low. How does that even work? It's just... it's surreal. I, I don't think I've ever played a game as unstable as this on launch day. Not only did it crash, but for the first week of play, my audio would just cut out and loop in and out, and in and out, and in and out, every five fucking seconds, or whenever an NPC would talk to me. I mean, I got used to it, but holy fuck, it was so annoying. No, you should have waited. Well, it's too late now. I, Zigward of the Knights of Katarina, fight by your side! Oh my god, Jesus Christ! This... This might not really be the fault of the game so much as it is my poor system specs, but goddamn, it froze and stuttered like a motherfucker. Even today, it's... It, it, it's just as much as I love this game, it has a plethora of technical issues. Oh, and... And here's something that I honestly find hilarious. So... During the first day of play, whenever I was summoned, both the host and other phantoms, and sometimes even enemies or other invading players, and, and even bosses, would just be stuck in an idle animation. How? I is this a server issue? Is this client side or server side? Does everyone see this? Is this just me? A and the funniest thing is, is you're basically invincible when this happens. Because unless you get invaded, you just don't take damage from enemies. This shit actually breaks the game and makes bosses easier to beat. And this shit was still happening to me two weeks later. I want to love this game. I really want to look at it and say, wow, that was a fantastic game from software. Great job, guys. Great game. But just, I'm so divided. There are a lot of things that I really loved about this game. But I can't just say that and completely deny From Software's absolute incompetence when it comes to releasing their games on PC. They have never even bothered to try and implement any formidable anti-cheat system. All it takes for you to hack in Dark Souls is to download a cheat engine table and BAM! You have access to infinite health, infinite stamina, instant transmission, practically dev tier console commands. Although. I'd be a bit of a hypocrite if I scorned people for hacking without admitting to the fact that I myself also did it. Some people get extremely defensive over hacking in video games, but I honestly just find it hilarious. Like, hacking in most cases is generally harmless, it's just a minor inconvenience. And hell, some people can actually produce some really cool shit by hacking and modifying the game files. Though the real problem here doesn't stem from players hacking, sure, it's shitty that they're doing it, but the only reason it's even possible is because the game doesn't even have a half-decent anti-cheat system. And you can barely consider the soft banning system to be an anti-cheat system, because a majority of the time, it doesn't even ban cheaters. You can get soft banned if the game crashes too much, or even just for using the Black Separation Stone too much. The soft banning system is garbage! 
Although From did just recently patch their game in response to the whole hackers supposedly soft banning player situation, which actually turned out to be nothing since nobody was actually soft banned because of it. But I mean, regardless of whether or not anybody was actually soft banned, the concept of doing it is still pretty shitty and something that I don't condone or would do myself. But that is besides the point here, because what I'm trying to say is just how awful From Software is with its PC releases. Someone had to stream themselves breaking the game for days before From decided to fix an issue that should never have even been prevalent in the final release.